All right. So I'm a bit of a history buff, and I like to draw attention to where we started to go bad. So you'll kind of notice that it took about two and a half million years to evolve. We, our cranial vaults have improved. We grew thumbs. But then over a very short period of time, we changed from the hunter-gatherer to the individual who sits with a barca lounger with his legs up. That's probably the only good thing that we do. Otherwise, we're dreaming of foods we never should eat, and otherwise just watching TV. Um, and this is evident by the way we've supersized. You notice that the 210 calorie fries, and I gave a talk at Harvard, and they made me block out the name on the fries. So that's why the fries are blocked out. It's true, it's true. So the number of calories in fries has gone up threefold. All right, so when we send people to McDonald's, that's what they're doing. But really, don't worry about it. You can walk it off in, four, in a couple of hours. But most people don't do that because they go here for dinner. So this is the heart attack grill. So you notice in the window, it says, taste worth dying for. And that's because <laughs> this is what you eat. This is 2,000 calories of meat, cheese. And you notice the things in front of her, the French fries, they call those flatliner fries. The, they are made in lard, which you see here hiding the camel box. So this is really quite an impressive thing. I, there's a picture I have of one of the patrons, but I don't show it because I'll probably get sued one of these days. <clears throat> and the problem also comes is that this is the way we exercise. So the only thing getting benefit is the Sheltie, and I think this kind of gives you an idea of where I stand on this whole thing. So what do we want to do? We'd like to prevent cardiovascular disease. So we can either be really good and do this primordially, and prevent the development of risk factors. Sometimes that's pretty hard because there's genetics. We could also prevent our first event, which is called primary prevention, or our subsequent events, which is called secondary prevention. <clears throat> so we talk about genetics. Some people feel they're sentenced. People say that if I have certain genes, there's no way I'm, I'm going to be OK. I'm going to get into trouble. But there's three studies that were done. Eric, a woman, the woman's genome study, and Malmo, and all of them show that even if you have a high genetic score, if you have a favorable lifestyle, your risk is lowered. So you should not feel that just because your family history isn't good and your family history is littered with people who end up having heart attacks or strokes, there is no reason to believe that you're not gonna be able to do something to at least minimize, if not completely avoid the problem. Because the prevalence of cardiovascular disease is growing dramatically. You can see that when you start to be old farts like me, about 70% of the population have cardiovascular disease and nearly everybody over the age of 80. Interesting study was done in Cleveland. So they, were, they do a lot of heart transplants and they, they get their hearts from people who die of motor vehicle accidents. So these are people who have head trauma. They are declared brain dead. So what they did was they looked at the amount of plaque sitting in their coronary arteries, and you'll notice that 37% of the people under the age of 20 or 30, the people in pink, had coronary atherosclerosis. 60% of people under 40, 71% of people under 50, and 85% of people over the age of 50 had some significant disease. So this is really an epidemic. What constitutes our risks are listed here. The ones in, 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 on your left are those that are modifiable, namely elevated lipids, inactivity, the absolute idiocy and sanity and stupidity of spending a lot of money on smoking, uh, obesity and hypertension, along with type 2 diabetes. The things that are not as modifiable, if at all, are your genetics, your age, gender, and ethnicity, uh, and also the history of cardiovascular events. So these things all together are going to cause, are going to give us reason to be concerned about whether we're going to have heart disease. So what are the orders of these? This is interesting. So there's uh, Salim Youssef is a guy from Canada. He did a study of 30,000 patients. <clears throat> and they looked at which one of the risk factors is going to be the most potent in predicting cardiovascular problems, an MI. Lipids far and away were the highest. After that smoking book, you'll notice psychosocial disease was number three. So really, stress, depression, et cetera, something that Dennis talks about a lot, uh, is very, very prominent. And then obesity, hypertension, and fruits and vegetables don't hurt you. It's not eating fruits and vegetables, not exercising, 
And then alcohol, of course, there's never enough alcohol. No, I'm just kidding. Um, alcohol is not a medicine, uh, but eat, drinking too much of it is really not good for you. So, I'm sorry? Lipids, lipids means a high level of LDL and a low level of HDL. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go in a, diff a different way. So we have told you about not eating cholesterol. So those of you who have been alive, as I have for many years, you remember that in 1984, we told you not to eat eggs. And then a couple of years later, we say, whoop, it's a good idea, eat eggs. So we are still vacillating back and forth. I will tell you that we, if you put a gun to my head, I would tell you that eggs are not terrible, but eat a couple of them a week, not every day. And the problem with eggs is what comes with them. It's the ham, the bacon, the toast with a lot of butter, and that kind of stuff. Um, and, the, and if you have a choice, eat one egg yolk and a couple of egg whites. Um, but it's a matter that you, know, you have to be sensible. And then the idea of just eating tons of fat just doesn't make a lot of sense. And there was a recent article about that. I think this is called the conspiratorial theory of disease, which means more or less if you look long, hard enough, you'll find somebody who agrees with what you think, and you can then follow what they're saying. I think realistically we know that plaque is made from fat, and I'll prove it to you in a couple of minutes. And I think eating too much fat is bad for you. But what is good for you is the Mediterranean diet. So Ansel Keys, many, many years ago, came to the unusual uh, discovery that in spite of people's cholesterols being at about the same level as other country, the people in Crete had a much lower level of cardiovascular disease. And where are they? They're on the Mediterranean. So they looked at the score of what kind of diets they were eating, and by and large, the Mediterranean diet score looks as it is here. Servings of vegetables, legumes, fruit, etc. I'm not going to go through each and every one of these, but what we do know is the more of that you eat, the healthier you are. <clears throat> the lower your risk of cardiovascular disease, the lower your risk of diabetes, etc. So which diet should you be on? In my mind, it's easy. You should be on the diet that saves lives. There's only been every other diet may talk about weight loss, they may talk about cholesterol lowering, but the only one that's been shown to save lives is the Mediterranean diet, a diet done in Spain called, a study done in Spain called Predimed, in which they looked at people between the ages of 55 and 80. These are individuals without cardiovascular disease, and they gave them several different diets. One of them, you notice on the bottom left, a low-fat diet, which is kind of what you would think of, which is namely avoiding olive oil, avoiding meats, etc. Then there was the Mediterranean diet that would either be given with walnuts, which are high in omegas, or virgin olive oil. Now, these people had a lot of virgin olive oil. They went through about a quart a week. You could bathe in olive oil at that rate, but they didn't do that as far as I know. But what did happen, both the, diet, the Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil, EBOO, and also with nuts, had a significantly lower risk of cardiovascular events. To me, that's the diet I would want to be on. That's the diet I tell patients to do you know, keto and paleo and other O's and Oreos and whatever. I, I look at this and say, all of these may be good for short term, but I can't endorse it long term. So the diets that you should really be thinking about are emphasizing the intake of fruits and vegetables, legumes, nuts, whole grains, fish is recommended, replacement of saturated fat with dietary monounsaturates, Monos are typically liquid at room temperature. Olive oil, canola oil, but they also come in avocado, fatty fishes like mackerel, salmon, sardines, um, and also come in nuts, <clears throat> namely walnuts, almonds, and hazelnuts. You want a diet that contains reduced amounts of cholesterol and sodium. Uh, it is reasonable to minimize the intake of processed meats, refined carbs, anything white. White foods are bad and sweetened beverages, and of course, eliminate trans fats. Not that hard, really is not. So let me introduce you to the lipid family. You can see that there are lots of people in the family, and there are different kinds of HDL and different kinds of LDL. We've known this for a long time. It's something that we look at and measure <clears throat> in many of our patients, if not all of them. But really what we're talking about most is LDL, and what you'll notice is there are six different kinds of LDL. I'm not going to go into this very much. 
because I don't think it's that much of an important issue um, as to whether we should be lowering LDL and how to do it, but just understand that it's there. So how is atherosclerosis occur? Pay attention. So this is atherosclerosis 101. You notice I call it an eating disorder with inflammation. So there is LDL hanging out in the blood. LDL comes inside the blood vessel wall where it gets the blood vessel very annoyed. Now think about this. When we were, whoever was in charge of designing us, I'm not sure who it was, taking no credit for that myself. And what we do know is, is that whatever happened, we were not programmed to deal with cholesterol. We were programmed to deal with viruses and bacteria, spears, snake bites, things like that. But cholesterol was never really part of it because it wasn't really part of what happened to primitive man or primitive animals, as I'll show you. So what happens is that when cholesterol gets inside the blood vessel wall, it sets up an inflammatory response. So here starts the eating disorder. White blood cells called monocytes are inflammatory cells that are kind of cruising around the inside of the blood vessel, and you see them kind of hanging out here, and they adhere to the surface and squeeze inside. Why are they doing that? They're looking for a meal, right? They get a sense, they get a message that is sent chemically that there is cholesterol here to be eaten. And what they do is they start to eat it. So what's a big eater? A macrophage. Macro is big, phage is eat. It's exactly what it sounds like. So these monocytes start gobbling up fat and they start to look like fat cells or foam cells and that's what they're called. These foam cells all get together, get a very bad bellyache and they die, and they form this common grave, which looks like a fatty streak. So this is now very inflamed. This is now the start of plaque. But there's more inflammation. More white cells are coming in for lunch and dinner, and they're still eating all this cholesterol. So overall, this gets bigger and bigger. Inflammatory enzymes called cytokines continue to be produced, calling in more white blood cells. And then you notice on your left, smooth muscle cells the cells in the outer layer of the, of the blood vessel start to proliferate. They start to grow. <clears throat> when they start doing that, they start making fibrous tissue, which is what happens in scarring. When there's inflammation, you get scarring. The same thing in the blood vessel. So now you've got a hunk of inflamed lipid inside the body of dying white blood cells. You have scarring that is going on around it, and then ultimately this forms a plaque. When the plaque gets big enough, it then starts forming a cap. This is almost like a pimple as we're getting used to this. So this fibrous cap is made in great part by these smooth muscle cells. And the strength of this cap determines what happens. If the cap is strong, the plaque grows, and it just continues to do what it wants to, getting bigger and bigger, until ultimately it may block your artery. If the plaque is skinny, it can rupture. And I'll show you what happens then. Because as the plaque gets bigger and bigger, the inside of the plaque starts to die. It becomes what we call necrotic. And then more and more enzymes are made, and lurking around in the blood vessel is something called a matrix metalloproteinase, an MMP. This thing takes aim at the corner of the plaque and ruptures the plaque. That is atherosclerosis 101. One of two things can happen. You can either allow this to go on unfettered, at which point the plaque grows and it ruptures, and you can then be one of the 30% of people who have heart attacks and don't survive three hours. These are the people who will rupture a plaque, have a large clot develop outside the plaque, and these people fall over in the street. Other people in whom the plaque grows, that there is a remodeling within the blood vessel wall, and the body learns to deal with this, are the people who will ultimately develop some chest pain. They may end up needing other things done, but they will survive. They might need stenting. Or if they saunter into my office or Dennis's office, we're going to take note of this, and we're going to try to lower their cholesterol. And here's how we start doing it. So we know that based upon genetics and, and therapeutic situations, LDL is our primary marker. There have been, uh, on the left is a graph that shows that when you're born with very high levels of LDL, your risk of coronary heart disease is high, and when you're born with lower levels of LDL, like 40, your risk of coronary disease is lower. So we've learned that based upon genetics, 
and other issues that determine this, this allows us to predict cardiovascular disease. The slide on your right shows the exact same kind of a curve only occurring in individuals who've been in drug trials. So we know that we can duplicate the benefit of drug trials just by trying to get you to be healthier longer term. So what does this mean? It means you try to intervene earlier. You don't wait for someone to have their heart attack. You don't wait for them to limp inside to the office with them having you know, half their heart gone. You do what you can to try to prevent that. Because we know that the cumulative exposure to cholesterol is critical. We know that in, in women with familial hypercholesterolemia, their cardiac age is 20 to 30 years older. In men, it's 10 to 20 years older. So that means a 40-year-old woman who was born with very elevated levels of LDL actually has a heart that's 60 or 70 years of age. So this is not good. <clears throat> and you can see, based upon the number of years that someone has existed here with an LDL of 160, you can see the incidence of coronary heart disease really starts to go up after it's been there for more than 10 or 11 years. Very important. And how high your cholesterol is tells you how bad it is in your blood vessels. When your cholesterol on your left is 50 or 60, you have almost no plaque. When your cholesterol levels get higher and higher, not only do you have plaque, but you have it in multiple sites. So this is why when you come into our prevention center, we're looking to get your LDL down not just below 100, but we're looking to get you down below 70 because that's where plaque doesn't grow. I beg your pardon? How much below 70? As low as I can get. What, what I just showed you here, 50 is... Check, jet, I'll, why don't you just hold that question, all right? Yeah, we're going to take <clears> the question at the end. So what we know is in drug trials, one of them with stable coronary disease, the TNT study, and also in studies in people after an acute cardiac event, the lower you get LDL, as you notice here in Prove It, below 40, the better you are. So our targets are evolving. 70 is so 1980, all right? We're now looking much, much lower. And when they've looked at eight different statin trials, the lower you get LDL, and to answer your question, there's your answer, below 50. Yes, that is the new target that we're trying to get to. Why? Because this is an area where plaque does not grow. You're shutting off the fertilizer, plaque stops growing, and may actually start going away. Regrettably, though, individuals at high risk, only 20% of people in the country who are at very high risk get an LDL down below 70. So you see that the, the, the sorrow involved in this is that we know it should be lower, but unfortunately, people don't get there. So let's look at why this happened. So back in 2004, doctors were given guidelines. This is the, what they call the ATP, Adult Treatment Panel 3, and it was kind of easy. If you're at high risk, they wanted LDL below 100. And at that time, an optional goal was below 70. And then so on, as the risk got less and less, they were permissive with getting LDL levels of 130, et cetera. Then some very smart guy in Chicago decided, no, 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 no. Doctors are goal-oriented. We're going to mess with everybody. Everybody's been number-oriented. We're just going to come up with statin groups. So this was completely crazy. Doctors didn't know what to do with this. Half the people ignored it. But by and large, what they decided was we're not going to tell you how low to get cholesterol. All we're going to do is tell you that certain people are at high risk. And if you're at high risk, throw a lot of statin at them. This did not resonate very well with doctors or with patients. And regrettably, things did not work out. But by and large, the thing that also didn't work out was they decided that I can think probably a couple of you in the room were kind of told, don't worry about it, you're over 75, you're on your own. That, over, that went over really well with people in AARP, um, more or less being told, if you're up to the age of 75, we're worried about you. Otherwise, we haven't studied enough of you, so we're not going to tell you what to do. And by and large, it meant that doctors could legitimately not worry about treating people over the age of 75. So that's just about it. And on your 75th birth, on your 76th birthday, you go outside and select a box. I'm not sure exactly how this works. But there are new guidelines that came into play in November of last year. These are busy, so let's go through this. <clears throat> so this doesn't show up that well. 
So if you're up to the age of 19 and your LDL cholesterol is not horribly high, you're not all that worried about. But between the ages of 20 and 39, there's a calculator to estimate what your lifetime risk is. Because really, we're not that worried about what's happening to people who are 25 or 30. We're worried about what's going to happen to them when they're 50 or 55. So we calculate that. So now we go to your upper right. If your LDL is more than 190, this is what I call the Southern Trooper mentality. Shoot and ask questions later. Right? You just treat the cholesterol, period. No davening, no questions, no calcium score, no nothing. Treat it. Why? Because that's what you need to do. If you're diabetic and you're over, uh, between the ages of 40 and 75, don't ask any questions. You're on a statin. There are some descriptors I'll give you in a minute, but those are the laws. If you're between the ages of 40 and 75 and you want to treat a bit more aggressively, you could then do a risk evaluation. But here, at least what they've done is that if you're over 75, talk about it with your patient. Doesn't mean ignore them, but it says talk about it with your patient. <clears throat> and then we have a calculator. What we try to do is identify risk using a calculator, and you can see the risks are between 5 and 7.5%, 7 to 20%, and over 20%. So this now is primary prevention. And we're trying to identify treatments based upon people's calculated risk. So this gets really complicated. So what came up was risk enhancers. And this is really useful. So if you have a family history, which is not part of the calculator, you're in trouble. If you have a cholesterol level of more than 160, you're in trouble. If you, if you look like Mr. Potato Head and you have prediabetes and have a big belly, have elevated triglycerides, a low HDL, an elevated blood sugar and high blood pressure, any three of the five, you have what's called metabolic syndrome. If your kidneys are not working perfectly and we calculate something called an, a GFR and it's below 60, you're in trouble. And this is now new. If you have inflammatory disease, like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, this is now a separate cardiac risk. If you have premature menopause as a woman and you went into menopause for whatever reason, before the age of 40, you're at risk, or if you have one of the entities during pregnancy called preeclampsia. And then the other thing that's been identified is that if you're of South Asian ancestry, you're at much higher risk. So these are all things that we'll look at that would then modify our impression of what kind of risk you're at for primary prevention. Other lipid biomarkers, we can look at inflammatory markers. We'll talk about LPA. We're not going to go into apolipoproteins, but one of the things that also can be calculated very easily, it's called an ankle brachial index, which is a measure of whether you have disease in your legs. So now we get down to people who have already had events. So these are the American guidelines. I'm going to show you the European guidelines in a few minutes, and they make ours look stupid. So the Europeans are the ones who are trying to save money. They're the ones on socialized medicine, and they are going much more aggressively. And I think those resonate with me. So by and large, on your right, if you're at very high risk, you should instantaneously, no arguments, be on a high-intensity statin. Your LDL must be below 70, and do that any way you can. You want to be on a high-intensity statin, and if not, if those are not getting your LDL where they need to be, you then go into a drug called a PCSK9. We're going to learn more about that in a couple of minutes. So the way they determine if you're at very high risk is have you had a heart attack, or what's called an almost heart attack, which is an acute coronary syndrome? Have you had a history of a stroke? or do you have very bad disease in your legs? These are the four things that are bad events. If you have two of these, you're at very high risk, or if you have one of these and one of these other conditions, high, elevated, uh, an age over 65, very high cholesterol levels, prior bypass or stents, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, if you're an idiot and you smoke, persistently elevated LDL in spite of statins, or a history of heart failure. So now we're getting a picture of people who will be at very high risk who need the book thrown at them. So now from here, 
We also look at modifiers if you're diabetic. So the question is whether diabetes is a risk for everybody. So diabetes is a risk for everybody, but it's more of a risk if you've had your diabetes for a long time. So if you're someone with one year of diabetes, it's very different than if you've had it for 10 or 20 years. So that's important. Whether your kidneys are leaking protein, whether your, the kidneys are not filtering as well, and then many diabetics have problems with their eyes, retinopathy, or problems with their nerves, which is neuropathy. Any of these things identify greater risk. So now move to Europe. So the European guidelines were brought out August 31st. So the American guidelines I just mentioned to you, Europe makes it easy. If you've had a heart attack, or you don't even need a heart attack, if you have plaque in your arteries that is significant, more than 50%, you are at very high risk. To me, this makes a lot of sense. Why you would want to wait for somebody to have an MI before you treat them aggressively just does not make a lot of sense to me. If you have diabetes with, again, target organ disease, which is what I just showed you over here, that puts you at high risk. And whether you have a family history of cardiovascular disease, which is huge. So if everybody in your family doesn't make it out of their 50s without developing heart attacks or needing bypass surgery, this is a very high risk. So you're capturing a lot of people in this other risk group. So these are the levels of LDL that are now being proposed. So remember we talked about 100 as a level back in 2004. Now we're looking at a level of 55 as a level for LDL in individuals at very high risk. This is quite a jump. And what it does do is it talks to us about how you're going to get there. You could eat birdseed and cardboard. You're not going to get your LDL down to 55, at least not easily. In many people, they're going to need medications, and the kind of medications they're going to need are going to be statins and frequently other drugs. And there, there are drugs called, there's a drug called azetamide, which we'll mention in a second, which I consider to be hamburger helper for statins. What it does is it helps the statin work a little bit better and helps lowering cholesterol levels. So these, again, are the risks. So just imagine someone at low risk, someone with just a little elevated cholesterol, they want your LDL down to 115. Not 160, 115. This is hugely different. Why? Because the burden of cardiovascular disease is huge. People having strokes and MIs, not only does it interfere with their quality of life, it also costs a, a fortune. And this is very, very important for societies. So I think these are very significant and believable data. I think the other important thing is, is that wherever you start from, if you become high risk or very high risk, your LDL needs to fall at least 50%. So we're not talking about a drug that's of mild potency. We're talking about a drug that's high potency. To answer the question, there are multiple statins. Some of the statins are not much more powerful than eating garlic and almonds. Other statins are much more potent. The high potency statins are two, a torvastatin, which was Lipitor, and rosuvastatin, which was Crestor. And using moderately high doses of them, which would mean 40 or 80 of Lipitor, or 20 or 40 of rosuvastatin. Those are the high potency statins. <clears throat> so these are the numbers that we have been living with as our goals in the prevention center for years. <clears throat> we have not felt that we wanted to practice medicine, which is based upon what we call a herd mentality, which is you treat a group. We treat every individualized patient. So in many patients, the, and the, the guidelines are really based upon data of thousands and thousands of patients, what we try to do is we try to individualize care trying to make it that these people, whoever it is, either doesn't have their first heart attack or stroke or definitely doesn't have a second one. And these numbers are the numbers that we've been shooting for for probably the past four to five years. So does it make sense? Well, the answer is yes, it does. We know that starting from LDL cholesterol levels of 190 um, and getting it down lower, even starting on your bottom left with LDL cholesterol starting as low as 70, 
that you could get significant benefit when you lower cholesterol levels. This is the data that was the first study to show that if you added something to a statin, that you could do something good with it. So this is a study called Improve It. Improve It looked at simvastatin, which is a moderately intensive statin, or simvastatin with azetamide, and what they showed was that with a, rel sorry, with a relatively small change in cholesterol, there was a highly significant reduction in development of cardiovascular uh, endpoints. So they proved that non-statin lowering of LDL with azetamide reduced cardiovascular events, that lower is better. And here, starting at 70, going down to 53. So a lot of people who thought 70 was great, not so much. Confirms the safety profile of other drugs, and then this, should be, this was considered for the way we shape the future. So how low is too low? So here's the news. When you compare us to the rest of the animal kingdom, we are the fat pigs in society. When you look at us on the bottom, the humans have LDLs of around, have, have total cholesterols of around 200, whereas everybody else has cholesterol levels that are dramatically different. Let's look at it in another way. You're born with an LDL of 30, right? And you're making hormones, you're making brain cells, you're doing just fine. Only as we get older and we start eating what we're eating, going to, going to Taco Bell and Burger King and getting there in an SUV rather than walking or riding a bike, our LDL cholesterols rise dramatically. So this is why we get into trouble when realistically we are programmed to be able to live with LDL cholesterols in the 30 to 40 range, which realistically has become a target. And the people who have the ultimate word are the two guys who discovered LDL, Brown and Goldstein. And if you see what's in red, in their mind, a level of LDL of 25 is just fine. All right? So this is, this is not just some people off the corner with an opinion. These are some pretty smart dudes. So now we get to the drugs that we were talking about, which is PCSK9. So this is a remarkable progression over about a decade of discovering a genetic abnormality in people who have either no PCSK9 or a lot of it and what it does to their cholesterol levels. So they were able to identify people, for example, these three, a 32-year-old lady, a 21-year-old African-American woman, and a 49-year-old Frenchman who had no PCSK9, and look at their LDLs, 14, 15, and 16, and doing just fine. Their brains were working, their bodies were working, and everybody was happy, and they had no heart disease. So there were two drugs that were developed. <clears throat> One was called alirucumab, which is praluent. The other one is called evolucumab, which is rapatha. So I'm only going to go through this briefly. There were two large studies, 18,900 patients in one called Odyssey. And what they were able to show that when they looked for the first occurrence of coronary death, non-fatal MI, stroke, or unstable angina, that you did very, very well. They were able to lower LDL cholesterol to those who remained on treatment about 50%, going from 103 down to 53. The reduction in events was significant. Now, I want you to look at these curves. What this shows you is that it doesn't separate immediately, but it takes about a year. And what you should also notice is that as time goes on, the curves continue to separate. What does that tell you? It tells you that you need to stay on the drug, that just because you come close to the drug or take it for a couple of weeks, is not the answer. And the same thing holds for lifestyle. People who say, look, I went on a diet, I lowered my cholesterol, my LDL came down, I can stop now, right? This is not something you cure, this is something you treat. So this is very important. Um, and they also were able to show a reduction in all-cause mortality. Fast forward to another trial, even bigger, 27,500 patients getting Repatha. So here they're looking for people not quite as sick people with high-risk coronary disease. The Odyssey trial was in people after MIs, but a very similar drug. They got LDL down 59%, which then persevered throughout the remainder of the trial. The other thing they noticed was a very similar pattern where the curves separate at about a year, about six months to a year, and continue to diverge 
with a significant improvement. But what they also looked at is what they call a landmark study. So when you look at the impact over the first 12 months, on your left, you see that. But from the 12th month going out to the third year, the, the, the improvement was almost doubled. So it's a matter of sustaining whatever practices you're doing and staying on medicines. Why am I emphasizing this? Because half the prescriptions that we write for cholesterol-lowering medicines are not refilled. Patients either decide that we're crazy, that we're, all of us are just, you know, we're just employees of the pharmaceutical companies, and they decide not to continue it. Or they could be a lot of other reasons. But regrettably, this is what happens. The drug does not work in the bottle. In this case, these drugs work very well when they're used correctly. They're even better in people that are sicker. And this is a common theme. If you have more arteries that are blocked, you do even better. And here we're looking, if you look on the left, use, this is with Evolucumab, Repatha. As you got down to LDLs below 20, there was continued benefit in reduction. So LDLs over 100, the event rate was 7.8%. LDLs of less than 20, down by about a third. So at levels, and even between 70 and 100, which used to be a very suitable goal that we would shoot for a couple of years ago, you can see that you can do significantly better if you get LDL down. And the good news is it was entirely safe. We worry about new onset diabetes. It did not happen with these drugs. And when you look at their cholesterol levels, I'm sorry, their glucose levels, you can see they absolutely don't change. So there are people that I treat who think I'm trying to make them stupid, okay? And everybody's convinced that we give people the statin, they're gonna get goofy. So the, the FDA mandated that they take 2,000 patients out of, the, out of the Fourier study, which is the one with uh, evolucumab, and then do very complex neuropsychiatric testing. The answer to it is not a bit of difference. Half of the people in this trial had LDLs below 25, and none of them became stupid, incoherent, non-English speaking individuals who then were clumsy and couldn't walk in front of themselves. So there was really no, no concern about cognitive impairment. So over the course of almost a quarter of a century, you can see that there have been progressive trials, all of which have explored starting at lower levels of LDL cholesterol and getting even lower and showing progressive benefit. And all of it is done safely. Where are we going next? Well, there's a new version of PCSK9 that is going to be, there's more data that will be presented at the heart meetings in two weeks, but this is a different kind of injection. <clears throat> and instead of getting either Repatha or Praluent every two weeks, this is every six months. So here they, they did it in an unusual manner. They gave the first dose at zero time. The next one you see a syringe at 90 days, and then six months later and LDL is reduced by 50%. Go another way, how about being vaccinated for cholesterol? And this is what happens here. You give the shot at one time, and at the end of a year, cholesterol is still lowered by 20%. So this is a drug called inclicerin. Uh, it is gonna be, they're looking to get approval for the drug sometime in the first quarter of next year, and my bet is that it's probably gonna get approval. So what they worry, so here, all the problems we worry about with people not taking medicine, they go into the doctor's office once a year, they get a shot in the doctor's office, and they're done. For those people who need more, they get two shots a year. Not a bad scheme. So the conclusion is that PCSK9 inhibitors significantly and safely reduce major cardiac events when added to statins. The achieved benefit validates the LDL principle that now down to 20, and then the question is, should we strive to achieve very low levels of LDL? And the answer is yes. We can do so effectively and safely. What happens when these drugs are not given correctly? So there's, they've done a study looking at several hundred thousand patients, and what they noticed was that about 61% of these prescriptions were rejected outright, and then of the, the prescriptions that were approved, 
15% were not filled because it was too expensive. So both companies have lowered their price for the drug from 14000 down to about 5600 a year. That's still very expensive, but a whole lot cheaper. Because when it's paid, when the, when the person has the drug paid for versus rejected, there's a 16% difference in whether you're going to have a heart attack, similar whether the drug is, is just not filled because they can't afford it. So we at, at, in our center have about an 85% approval rate, which is about double of what the, the rest of the country gets. So we've been very, very lucky and successful. There's one other thing that I want to talk to you about, because I'll bet you most of, a lot of you in the room don't even know what this is, and I'll bet you half your doctors don't know what it is. This is something called lipoprotein A. It is something you're born with. It is something that has become a rapid player in the, in the, in the development of cardiovascular disease, <clears throat> and the reason is because no one looks for it. It is present in 20% of the population. People have, meaning high levels are present in 20%, um, and about 2 or 3% have values high enough to get you really in trouble. So what this is, in the center, you see that little yellow sphere. That is a molecule of LDL. But it has a little tail that have these KVs. These are what's called Kringle repeats. It's not important to go through that, but these, this structure becomes proatherogenic. You see on your left, it can promote plaque. It becomes inflammatory, right, which is bad. And also the, 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 the hat trick, so to speak, is it makes your blood more likely to clot. You shake all those together, and you get a much, much higher cardiovascular risk. Proof in point, people with LP little a's that are over 117, which is about four times the upper limits of normal, have a tripling of risk. The last is the, one of the last people I saw in my office today was an individual whose cholesterol levels were not fairly elevated, but his LP little a was about three times the upper limits of normal, and this guy had significant cardiovascular disease. When LP little a is between 30 and 76, it's about a doubling of risk. This is something you need to get measured. It's a blood test. It's paid for. I promise you it's worth it. If it's not abnormal, you only get it done once, you never do it again. But if it's high, it should, or at least could, uh, influence the way your healthcare practitioner is going to do things. Let's just go through a couple more minutes, less than five minutes. HDL, forget about it. All right, everybody comes in, my HDL is good. Why am I getting into trouble? Bad news. It's not how much HDL you have, but how functional it is. And what determines HDL functionality may be triglycerides. So triglycerides, if you remember, are part of what was bad in metabolic syndrome. And what we're now understanding is that triglycerides may be the bad player, and HDL may not be such a bad player at all. Uh, and we're doing more and more to look into this. It's still not a forgotten lipoprotein, but I think it's an important one. Triglycerides are what happens when you metabolize carbs and other fats. They, you, you, do, you metabolize them down to what's called a glycerol. If you put three glycerols together, it's a triglyceride. What does the body do with this? They store it for energy. If you make too much of it, it stores in your liver, your muscle, your heart, and then and you become, you can get sick from just this. You've heard of people talking about a fatty liver. This is what gets deposited. So there have been numerous studies that have looked at this. Suffice it to say that elevated triglycerides, here a cohort of 25,000 people, significantly increase risk. Uh, the AHA has said that you should be eating one or two seafood meals at least a week in order to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. They went a little bit further recently saying that taking a supplement that is a prescription, not over the counter, of either something called EPA and DHA, which are two omega-3s, or EPA alone, may be very effective in the treatment of triglycerides. A study called Reduce It was done looking at one prescription uh, omega-3 fatty acid. It's called ethyl, which is basipa. Bottom line, it reduced the composite of events by 25%, which include dying. Pretty, pretty impressive. Taking a fish oil supplement 
and not having a stroke in MI or dying, sign me up. Um, and then the other primary composite of fatal or non-fatal MI and stroke reduced 26%. And then when they look at the number of events someone had, whether it was your first or your fifth event, these numbers were significantly reduced. But this is not for everybody. This is for somebody with elevated triglycerides, maybe those people with diabetes, but also in people who are already well-treated, getting good doses of cholesterol-lowering medicine, because these people had triglycerides of 215, right? Not 100 or lower. And these are people whose LDLs were in the low 70s. So this is a very circumscribed group of patients who may benefit. There are two studies that we'll be learning more about soon. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so this is, one study is looking at another fish oil. Another one is looking at another triglyceride drug. All I can tell you is tune in, we'll get more news. This is the, the uh, these are the over-the-counter fish oils. These are not drugs, they're food supplements. They are not regulated by the FDA. And this is what they look like when you look at the dietary supplement versus the, the prescription. The prescription one is clean and clear, the other stuff has all sorts of crap sitting inside of it. About a third of it is saturated fat. And some of this stuff is expensive. So in the end, what ends up happening? We end up with people like this, who R.J. Harwell, who gave up smoking booze and red meat. He died anyway. We end up people coming into my office. A fat diabetic gave me this slide. Give it to me straight, doc. How long do I have to ignore your advice? And this guy really meant it. He thought this was hysterical. So I want to give you what's really important. So this is a study of people with heart failure. And on your left is whether you have stage one or stage two or stage three or four heart failure. And you can see that stage three or four, you die much more likely. But would you believe the same impact of a good marriage or a bad marriage? All right? So be happy. The next thing is, what about kids and pets? So it turns out the more kids you have, the greater your cardiac risk. People, look at it. People with more kids, they tended to be fatter, and a lot of them smoked. But what, what about pets? Turns out more pets are good for you, but as you notice, it's better off to have a dog than a cat. So what I can leave you with is average risk factors confer considerable risk. Eat complex carbohydrates, not refined carbs. Omega-3s, but in general, eat less. Don't smoke. Every day be physically active. Have a drink or two and do something enjoyable. Marry happily and have good friends. Have lots of dogs, but fewer kids and cats. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. As promised,